the Northern countries have been traditional donors supporting such social development processes. Uh, how do you see the BRICS sustaining this going forward? Will South-South cooperation be a method in this? I hate to think that I predicted the rise of Trump, but uh, <laughs> he, is, he is clearly doing what he can do to uh, undo the <coughs> existing set of arrangements. And, and certainly, uh, China is not uh, ignoring this. They are, you know, One Belt, One Road initiative uh, is a, sort of a clear step into the gap that's being left by the U.S. retreat. Um, I, uh, in the long run, I don't think it's a bad thing for much more BRICS uh, influence and a, and a much more inclusive global system. I, I would be concerned if that inclusive global system tends to central concentrate power in the way that it's been over concentrated in the last 40 years in the US. So part of the challenge is how are we gonna get along with each other and do that under a shared set of rules that encourages the rule of law rather than the rule of might. Uh, I, I don't think might is gonna go away as a factor, but I think it could be more constrained uh, than it is, for instance, within China, uh, or for that matter, within the US. So part of the challenge, it seems to me, is how do we develop an international system that emphasizes the rule of law and challenges people who abuse, uh, I think, global initiatives like I EITI, for instance, the Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, is one of the things that's emerged from NGO activity that could be a huge factor in increasing the rule of law globally. Uh, but I think we need to invent more of those and get them into place in the teeth of a lot of resistance from current power holders, both governmental and corporate, who may not want to see the rule of law uh, influence their activities. CSOs, and I'm not sure I have anything to say about that, but going back to the BRICS and the emerging um, regional uh, coalitions, I think that, that the important thing is that, that, that those countries and those coalitions within and among themselves get clear on the vision of what the world should be doing. Uh, not to take a, not beyond the power struggle of making it happen. What's the vision that's the post-colonial, post-Pax Americana vision that's appropriate for the world? Mm -hmm. And then, in that role, CSOs have a lot to say, civil so society have a lot to say. Um, so I think the responsibility for an alternative vision that makes sense globally doesn't lie with us anymore. <laughs> ours didn't work. <laughs> um, although ours, I think, had a lot of a lot of positive stuff. I think our our uh, 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 commitment to democracy and to selling democracy around the world, whether we've done it well or done it poorly, done it clumsily or done it with some sort of finesse, <laughs> has had a positive effect. The values that we hold are human values belong to everyone. So um, so that's 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 you underestimate the declining power of the US because I feel the US's power, America's power over people is not political as much as it is cultural. And it is still the destination, even among Indians, yes. Yes. young people today who tell them to give you a job worth 50 lakhs per annum here in India or a chance to migrate to the US, they will choose the migration. Even if it means going and washing dishes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Because it's still seen as a place where you can do what you want. Indeed. Right? However, so, true or yes, that is. <laughs> yes. So that, that cultural dominance is not going away. 
you know, it's it's no longer it may not be McDonald's because nobody even in India I think sees McDonald's as a U.S. corporation. Yeah. But Netflix, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon, mm -hmm. things which are so much part of our world. Facebook. In Facebook, you know, Twitter, any or Google, Microsoft, any organization you talk about is U.S. And recently I saw some data which said top five corporations in the world, global corporations, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Walmart, their combined net worth is much more than all the southern countries' GDPs put together. So that influence is not going away. If anything, it's strengthening and if anything, it's, it's insidiously shaping how people behave. So I, think, it, I think there is another part of the right. I, I think the cultural part has to look at music in your creative domains. If you even look at academia, you know, you know, so, uh, uh, the, the, or you look at, uh, you know, uh, freedoms related to very personal sort of dress or you know what you eat or what you there is a, there is a certain cultural ethos in US which is distinctive mm -hmm. which is not even in Europe which is not even in Europe. Uh, and uh, and it, it generates a a sort of a process of creativity and assimilation at the same time you know it, you, I think there is a there is a dynamism there, you know, academic freedom, interesting. There, there is good and bad, fine, but that space doesn't even exist in many other uh, countries, um, you know. And, and I think that that uh, the the a very early on, it's part of part of very early on sort of upbringing of family. And I, I don't know what it is, but you know, take risk. <clears throat> you know, go bumble. You know, a lot of countries are doing uh, you know gap year nowadays. A lot of families in India encourage their children to do gap year. But the way American kids come and do gap year, do anything. You know, take risk. Do, do be as crazy or bizarre. Our gap here would be, uh, you can go to UK, but your child says, no, I'm going to Colombia. I said, no, 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 they are terrorists, they don't, can't go to Colombia, you know. So there is something in that culture which is, which is very powerful and very attractive, very magnetic and important. And I, I think sometimes the institutional manifestation of that culture may appear uh, oppressive or or problematic, but you know there, there is a there is a dynamism there that uh, that is a different different order. Uh, you know, despite all the frailties of <coughs> society in its own way, but uh, this this is a, I mean, you, you see the field of music, you see the field of you know art or intellectual work and creativity in other domains and all. Um, it's just, uh, just so, I mean, people may consider Paris as the fashion capital or whatever, but <coughs> folks in the U.S. do it much better. <laughs> you think we are diverse, but we are not. We are homogeneous. The if you see how many Turkish people live in India, how many, um, you know, Ethiopians live in India, and, and that is the strength of, uh, of North America. For whatever its frailty is, you know, <coughs> Dave was telling just a half an hour, two hours ago, that 45% of all startups in US come from new immigrants. 45% of all startups. Where does, that means creativity is coming from people who are newly arriving in North America. And why they are creative? Because they are bringing one culture, one set of ideas, it interacts with another culture, and that's where creativity happens. Creativity will not happen in homogeneous space. So, 
there is something about that culture, how it has come about or what it is, I am not, but it's distinctive. You don't find it's when you started the organizations that you did, and we are a classic example of it, 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 of it being in its 36th year. Uh, we see a lot of startups in India. There's a drive by the government to promote startups. How do you see the startup generation contributing towards building institutions of social change, which deliver uh, social development programs in, at the grassroots levels? How is it that they will keep the building institutions? Or will we have any other form of mechanism to lead the social development process? Again, from the, from the United States point of view, there are probably, actually not many, but way too many new NGOs get created every day. And that's a function of people's urge to solve the problem, um, uh, deciding not to take a first step to see if anybody else is working on the problem, but uh, it's, the, it's, it's the flip side of this uh, I can do it myself, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and I think like in, in business, you know, some are going to succeed, some are going to fail. Um, and the majority are not going to be sustained uh, for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but, but I think that in some measure, the, the, the health of a society is in those startups, in people as, you, as Rajesh was saying, and this is obviously an American, U.S. point of view, take the risk, see what you can do, see what can happen. And you, if you think about them as social experiments, they can be nothing but a good thing. That you've got ideas out there, some are going to catch hold, some are going to be very effective, others may not go anywhere. Um, I think the, the the need for in the U.S. to use solutions to all problems is very is very real. And if that comes from a new generation of civil society actors coming up, that is fabulous. That's wonderful because their old problem. I mean, the old problems that they persist. They persisted throughout the history of, of our country, but they persist in a different context now than they did 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So from the point of view of a support organization like Korea is developing perhaps a capacity to help people refine and test their ideas and uh, provide support, guidance, and whatever. Where should that idea uh, take a trajectory on its on its own. Where is that idea? Really not a new idea, but a variation of an idea has been around. And if it's a variation of an idea, how can they connect with that other idea and make it more relevant or more uh, contemporary, perennial, and more effective? So it's discerning what what is you know where is that genius? Where is that next Bill Gates in the, in the civil society uh, and supporting whether it's a, a farm <laughs> or a garage <laughs> or somebody's basement, uh, supporting those really creative new approaches uh, to have a chance to flower uh, while helping direct entrepreneurs in the civil society space perhaps to say, this is great, what you need to do is try to get the resources for an XYZ to work with you. Um, but uh, it may be just an American disease, but I can do it better myself than anybody else has ever done in the world. It's a very common way of thinking. Dave, would you like to say something on that? Uh, last week, there's a columnist for the New York Times named David Brooks, who is my favorite Republican. And he wrote two columns last week, uh, one about uh, amphibians. And amphibians are people who learn to live in very different systems. So people, uh, and I realized that uh, 
uh, made some decisions early in my life that made me more amphibious than many by going and living in Ethiopia for a while and growing up in a Bangor, Maine, which is a small town, uh, and going off to Boston to school to uh, very different worlds. And amphibians uh, are able to live in different contexts, but they're also more likely to sort of put things together in a new way uh, that allows them to be creative because they're used to sort of seeing, gee, it's not all this way, it's some people see it that way, and other people see it this third way, and maybe we can put those together in a different synthesis. And the other, the other column was about change makers, based on uh, his conversations with Bill Drayton, who started the Ashoka Fellows. And Drayton went looking for social entrepreneurs, people who were trying to do new things that had social outcomes. And they sort of looked at patterns and thought about them and figured out different ways to respond to those patterns. And he, his argument in both these columns is we need more amphibians and we need more change makers, people who are gonna grapple with the problems of the world. And uh, it seems to me that to, to the extent, well, as I heard your comments about the US project, I, I think that U.S. historically has had a culture that encouraged people to be both amphibious and to try being change makers. One thing about change makers is you can count on failure. Uh, but failure either can be a catastrophe that makes you go to bed and never want to get out of your house again, or an opportunity to learn something, or both. Probably both for most of us. I know that I had a lot of catastrophes that made me not want to leave the house, and I've also frequently learn from catastrophes. So, I, I think to the extent societies can create the circumstances in which people both learn to live with difference uh, and to, to be creative about that, and also to sort of perceive something they want to work on and figure out how to do it, uh, then those societies are likely to deal with this current world more constructively than the societies that tamp down difference. I mean, I, I also read last week an article about China's use of surveillance and their move toward having each individual in society have a social reliability score, which uh, would let you get promoted and make you more have more access to the goods of the society. It seems to me it's less likely you're going to say, this is a silly situation, let's change it. Uh, so I think a society with wide use of surveillance to promote social reliability scores are not going to be societies that grow or change or develop innovations very fast. On the other hand, uh, I, I will not treat you to my rant about uh, President Trump taking, out of some, taking us out of the Paris Accord, but I could do a rant on that at great length into Jay's ultimate boredom. So, so I, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, for change and for articulating new visions of what we ought to be doing. And I think it's basically in the interest of most societies to encourage that. <clears throat> about the role of civil society in realizing a vision that's post colonial mm -hmm. post-American. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also wondering the role that academia can play in it. Mm -hmm. Now, in India, by and large, apart from a few spaces where they do social sciences, most of the academia is uh, very disconnected to civil society action. Uh, either they're very skeptical of what they're doing, <coughs> very dismissive of it, or I don't know, maybe they have a different vision of social action. Uh, so I was just wondering that how do you bridge the gap, how, how do you bring them together? And then again, uh, what about uh, early education? What about education in schools? How do you make that education uh, committed to social change and social action? Um, so yeah, um, I'll start with the second first and then 
be my uh, not uh, observer's view of apathy um, and, and social change. I I think that the um, the education of children um, is at least in our context, a place where if the child is fortunate and they live in a diverse community, where simply by being educated with other kids who are different, who have different languages, different cultures, and whatever, um, enables them to have some of this amphibian characteristic that David was talking about. So the challenge in, in our country is to promote that diversity of the, the classroom. And we have become uh, resegregated in the US in terms of our education systems by geography. Um, and um, except in a few urban situations, um, that is the case. The curriculum in the US, as much as I'm know of it, which is very little, brings into the classroom current issues and uh, social concerns at the age appropriate level. <coughs> and so the days are gone by when teachers in schools would take the Me Too movement, for example, and not let kids talk about it. Mm -hmm. But again, age appropriate. So the, the creating a permeable, permeable boundary between the society and this classroom in uh, program plan curriculum, but in opportunities for kids to not only um, express what they think, but have a deeper learning about what's going on and begin to have critical thinking about that, which is a big part of, I think, what the US education is renowned for. It's not to learn the facts and, and spit them back so much as is to take a problem and say, what is this? What do you think about it? Why do you think about it? What does that mean? And learn from other people's point of view. Um, so to me, if I were going to worry about society, I'd look at the children's education much more than the academic education, which brings me to the academic. As a, as a spouse of an academic, I have a very jaded view <laughs> of the institution. <laughs> and I think the incentives there, you just have to look at the incentives for the academics. And the incentives are, for those who are serious about their career, are to know more and more about less and less, mm -hmm. publish in more obscure places that have no relevance to anything in the world. Mm -hmm. And so trying to get them to pay attention to civil society and social um, uh, concerns as at an institutional level uh, is a huge challenge and I would question the, the value of the effort made to do that. Find those academics who are not unlike this person sitting here, who are renegades, mm -hmm. who, who have a, a value what academia can offer in terms of helping people think better and to articulate those thoughts and provide some um, uh, somewhat uh, permanent ideas out there that can be shared and can be tested. And engage them to work with you. And help them find a way to do it. Buy out a part of their time their quote-unquote research time. So they can keep their career moving, but they can actually do stuff that they will value personally and professionally and will make them better academics, I think, in the end. But it's, it's kind of like people who work for consulting firms. You know, they get a day a week to do social good and something like that. Think of it that way, because yeah, you're not going to change the incentives of the academy, um, which, um, have long-term social value, but not a lot of practical application. That's my <laughs> <laughs> Just a word or two about the academic side of this, because I'm 
at least in the US, there is a, a pressure for academics to publish in, quote, A-list journals. A-list journals are defined by their rigor and their popularity within the upper levels of the discipline yeah. and their irrelevance to almost everything. <laughs> so people get promoted because they make themselves more and more specialized and less and less relevant right. and not contaminated by real world problems. Uh, um, so, some people uh, are somewhat immune to this pressure for various pathologies in their backgrounds. Uh, but I think uh, somebody who's rational about an academic career has to take seriously the A-list term problem. I think this is somewhat undermined in university departments and schools that try to be responsive to external constituencies. So for instance, business schools often depend on corporations for access and money, etc. And if they if they don't produce knowledge or activity that the corporation sees valuable, they're not they pay. So it may be true for other professional schools like medical schools or law schools. Um, but I think also that means there are a number of academics who would love to have opportunities to do something relevant. So that if you can find them and find a way for their expertise to advance civil society goals, uh, they will be interested. But I, I I'm not optimistic about academic reform. Uh, having tried at one time or another to do some of that. Uh, and there are just a lot of forces that we can. Uh, it's, it's like ask, asking very wealthy people not to spend some of their wealth on political activities that uh, lead to item, uh, outcomes that are bad for the society but good for a small 1%. Yes. <laughs> 